assembly of the transfer case with all the new parts. Let's get back to George's Valley Hybrid shop in Stockton, California and get started with this reassembly. All right, so at this point, we've got the bench cleaned up again, and we're starting to lay out our parts, including all the new components we're installing. We're doing a terrain tamer part-time kit, then a pair of sumo gear kits. One of them is an underdrive, one's an overdrive portion, and then also a sumo transfer case rebuild kit. And we'll cut these open one at a time and go through them. Where did all these parts come from, George? Funny you should mention that. So obviously we don't just work on Land Cruisers, but we sell parts, we stock parts, and part of our job is to make sure we guide our customers in the right direction. So they end up with the right parts that'll fit and last. We don't necessarily sell everything out there because we're pretty picky about the parts we install and the quality, which is one of the reasons why we only do sumo gear and terrain tamer and not some of the Chinese knockoffs. I'm sure you've seen the difference in some of these gear set prices where the Japanese stuff, which really came from Sumo and was developed in conjunction with Marlin and originally were only sold through Marlin. There are knockoffs out there that cost probably half. I've seen a couple sets fail and realistically, none of us here at the shop would ever install them or sell them. We believe in supporting people that come up with the original ideas and the inventors and pillars of the community versus just some copycat design. Personal preference, but ultimately we're all a small family. We all know each other, we all support each other. And it's a very symbiotic relationship. We support good vendors, we support the customers, customers support us. It's all a big giant circle and we all help each other out and that's how it's gotta be. So you mentioned Sumo. What is this name right here, Cruiser Brothers? How do they come into the picture? So Cruiser Brothers was a secondary company we started about seven years ago as a parts business. And we are, resellers, importers, distributors, wholesalers, retailers, and installers. But ultimately, Cruiser Brothers is a Land Cruiser parts store. We sell everything from Sumo, we do RCV, we do Terrain Tamer, you name it. We do Holly fuel injection, we do AC kits, we do long range tanks, ARB suspension, Dobinson. If it's a product for a cruiser, chances are we stock it or we can help you out with it. We do Eaton lockers. We were the importer for hair lockers for six years before Eaton even made lockers for the Toyotas and imports. We work on cruisers. We try to supply parts for cruisers and we try to be a one-stop shop. The other thing we can do that we pride ourselves in is that we don't just sell these parts. Obviously we work on cruisers all day, every day. So if you look around the shop, it's chock full of cruisers. And every once in a while we let a Lexus in here. <laughs> when you're buying parts from us, you can just about be guaranteed they're gonna be the right parts, they're gonna fit, and we can offer the proper tech support. We're not just some online business that says, oh yeah, you can buy a re-gear package, and then you call and say, well, do I need a knuckle kit or not? We're gonna tell you everything you're gonna need for the job. It's part of our job to do so. Okay, we might as well unbox all this stuff and take a look at it so you guys can wrap your mind around what all goes into these. You saw the teardown, now let's go about what parts we're gonna put in here. We'll start with the rebuild kit. When you take it apart, it doesn't look like there are that many components and bearings and everything in there, but every single one of these boxes represents a bearing. So you have a total of 10 bearings in there, which most other transfer cases use six or seven. This case uses 10 bearings. And one of the reasons why these kits are so expensive is you can see that the bearings are all either NSK or Koyo, which is an OE vendor for Toyota. So when you buy a new Land Cruiser or any Toyota, it's gonna have Koyo or NSK bearings in it, which again, Sumo Gear Company only uses Japanese manufactured components. There's no Chinese stuff in there and nothing from Taiwan or-, or Mexico. Mexico, Philippines, whatever. And some of those might be great quality also, but Sumo prides themselves in using only Japanese manufacturers. And that's what we use. We've been friends with the owner of Sumo for a very long time. He is a big reason in conjunction with Marlin and a couple of others, why we have gear sets like this available. The mini truck low range gears, the Samurai gears, the Orion transfer case, the Atlas transfer case, the split case gears, all that stuff, Sumo is part of it. So we support the people who come up with these ideas. Anyways, so great kits, all the bearings are in there. Seals, O-rings, they even give you a PTO cover gasket, which in the US was never an option. We never see them, but they try to offer as complete a kit as possible. That gasket you're not gonna use, everything else will definitely be installing. Takes care of the rebuild kit. Next thing we'll do is from Terrain Tamer in Australia, we have the part-time kits. These are nice because it's a complete kit, so you don't have to go shopping for a spool and then hubs and whatever else you might need. 
they even give you the bearing that goes on the back of the spool. This is your transfer case spool and replaces the differential we talked about during the teardown. So instead of having the casting in the back that took all the bolts and then the side gear and the spider gears and everything, this part replaces that. It is splined here for the rear output shaft and to give you new bearing, the OE bearing, Train Tamer is great about supplying OE components. They give you a new rear bearing because most people, when they put a part-time kit in, they don't do a full rebuild, but it's almost impossible to remove the old bearing from the rear hub, so they supply a new bearing. They also supply spacers for the front flanges or hubs, depending on what year your Land Cruiser is. These might be used or not. Comes with a good instruction set on how to install the kit. Obviously, since we're doing this, you won't need those. Unless you're doing just a part-time kit, then these will come in very handy. And they give you a set of ABM hubs designed specifically for this application. The ABM hubs come in two styles. They come in a professional line and the standard line. The silver boxes are the professional line. These are pretty much their top of the line locking hubs and will bolt right onto any 80. You don't have to modify the berth. You don't have to modify anything. They just bolt on install them, be done with it. So you don't have to tear the knuckles apart to do it. So how long has AVM been around? Cause I don't know that much about hubs, but I know obviously ASIN, it was OE supplier for Toyotas that had locking hubs. So where did AVM come from? So AVM is actually a company out of Brazil. They have been around for quite a while too. I would venture to guess over 20 years. I'm not exactly sure, but I would say somewhere between 20 and 30 years. Some pros and cons, some people don't like the ABM hubs. They're just not used to them. The nice thing about them is that they're literally 100% bolt on. And we have rebuild kits for them in stock. We have the little bolts, we have the gaskets, and ultimately we don't see problems with these hubs. You know, some guys say, oh no, we've seen issues with those. Show me proof. It's one of those things, people get used to an idea. It's similar to the idea of the Harrop or Eaton e-lockers versus the ARB. We're all used to ARB lockers. They've been represented in the US for 30 years. And that's what we used to when it comes to selectable lockers. Then the Eaton's come into play and people go, oh no, you know, you can't run those, they have problems. But it's one of those things, there's a lot of hearsay out there. And ultimately, unless somebody can give you a firsthand report and say, yes, that is a problem, and here's why, maybe take it with a grain of salt. We've installed dozens of these sets and they've been really good for us. Yeah, I remember we see somebody talking bad about Eaton e-lockers. They're usually proponents for ARB. Exactly, and chances are they've never run one. We were the importer for Harrop for six years before Eaton started doing their own electric lockers for imports, including Toyotas, which they started with. And we've sold well over a thousand of them. There are multiple trucks in here that have Eaton lockers in them. And out of all those lockers, we have never, ever had to send out a single replacement on the warranty. That cannot be said for any other locker, including ARBs. And we sell and install a lot of ARBs also, but the Eatons are ultra reliable and trouble free. It's a simple system. It's an electromag. What could go wrong? Yeah, that's the locker that I put on my 98 Forerunner. I put yeah. an Eaton in there. And before we started selling them, we installed them on three, what we call Expo 80s. So all built 80 series on 35s and 37s, heavy trucks that could travel to Baja and get wheeled and off-roaded and driven there, driven back. And I installed a front one in my personal 100 series that already had the factory rear locker. All those trucks still have those lockers in them and they're all working perfect. And we ran them for a few months before going public and saying, hey, we're now the importer for hair blockers. So that's how that came into play. So that's a pretty good testament that they're reliable. They've been good for us. And again, we have firsthand experience. We've installed lots and lots of them. I have two of them sitting in buckets that are getting shipped to our friend Jason at Trail Taylor for one of his builds. We do a lot of his transmissions and transfer cases and differentials, if not all. This GX has two Eaton e-lockers in there and we re-geared the truck and it's got a diamond rear axle in it with an Eaton locker also. And they've worked flawless. So whenever we have the option, we actually prefer the Eaton locker to the ARBs because of their reliability. That's nice to know because so, I own one. <laughs> there you go. So rear spool, let's get back on topic here. Yep. We're gonna put that with all our rear components that we now have laid out. Then we'll get into the gear sets. And obviously we have all these components in stock. So if you guys are working on a transmission or transfer case or differential, give us a call. This is what we do. We work on trucks, we sell parts. Cruiser Brothers is a fantastic part source if you need help with your cruiser or a project, or if you just have questions about what products you might've bought from us or you're thinking about buying from us. So this is our underdrive gear set. You can tell by the spline portion 
This is our replacement input gear, and this is our replacement high-speed output gear. They're packed in Cosmoline or something similar to Cosmoline to prevent rust. So once you pull them out of the package, run them through the solvent tank. If you don't have a solvent tank, you can soak them in gasoline for a while, maybe in a bucket outside or whatever, covered up, so you don't have to deal with the fumes. But you want to get some of this stuff off, this brownish stuff you see on here. It's really to protect the product from rusting while it's in storage. And if you look close, all this stuff, sumo gear, made in Japan. Every single one of the gears has that on there. So that takes care of our high range gears, underdrive, to compensate for larger tires. And then this is our low range gear set, which we showed you just a minute ago when comparing the factory gears to the aftermarket low range gear set. Same situation. They come packed in Cosmoline. Obviously it says made in Japan. It's a two gear set. Now we'll finish laying everything out and then we'll build a case. Okay, now that we have all our parts cleaned up, organized, prepped, so the new gears have gone through the solvent tank and been prepped, everything's cleaned up and ready to go, I lay everything out again and make sure I group things together so the hardware stays together, snap rings, bearings, whatever I need for a certain portion of the build, I group together again. It takes a minute longer, but it makes it a whole lot easier to figure out what's gonna be used with which component. Then I build all my separate components so I'll build the rear extension housing, the front extension housing, the output cluster, the idler cluster, the input gear. I prep the case halves. Once I have all those prepped, then I put all the assembled components together. In this case, we're gonna start with the idler. It doesn't really matter where you start. You can do the outputs, you can do the idler input, transfer case output assembly, doesn't really matter. So I just grabbed the first one and we're gonna work our way through. Everything checked out good. Gears look beautiful. Bearing surfaces look nice. Everything's good. Again, if you look closely, you can see a little oiling hole. So the oil that's being directed through the case, either by passive flow or active from the pump, is directed through all this stuff. There's a roller bearing that sits on here that supports our idler low-speed drive gear. You can see where the bearing rides on here. There's just the tiniest little, it's not even a mark. It just shows where the bearings ride. So one oiling hole supplies the lower row bearings and the other one, supplies the upper row and this bearing can go on either way it doesn't matter originally when we took this apart we made sure to notate that the square cut splines go down low right so it's going to slide down in there and then we're going to have a bearing and the gear this gear is small enough in diameter that the slider will slide all the way across it so this doesn't have to be on there until installation it can actually fall off so it's easier just to keep it off for now i use gear oil when i assemble cases Unless they're going to be stored for a long time, then I use assembly lube. But I like having a nice layer of oil on all my components. Put our bearing on, spin it a little bit, and put a little bit more oil on here. And our gear, all the cosmoline has been cleaned off. Just slides on. Bearing's gonna slide on there. I always try them first. Again, a little bit of oil. I use the pipe and the hammer. You can just use a pipe and a hammer. Again, when we do these videos, instructional videos, I try to keep it as simple as possible. You can absolutely do this in a press. You can use a piece of pipe and a hammer. There's different ways of doing it. We're trying to keep this super simple so anybody can do it. Again, you just saw that. It was very little effort and went right together. It's not like these are a super tight press fit. I assemble this side first. That way I can flip it over and not worry about damaging the cage on this bearing because this inner shaft actually is taller than the bearing. So if we put this on the bench upside down, you're not gonna hurt this bearing cage. Same thing here, a little bit of oil. Okay. Now is that bearing driven flush with the... It actually bottoms out. It bottoms the out? The inner race of the bearing bottoms out on the gear. And to double check it, we're gonna go with a slightly larger tube. Obviously you have to make sure that the tube isn't too small so it hits the inner shaft here and not too big so it hits the cage because it'll distort the cage and possibly damage the bearing. So you want something that can kind of float here in no man's land on the inner race. And you can hear the sound change when you drive the bearing on versus it bottoming out. Pretty distinct. So that's all there is to the idler assembly. At this point, we can put our slider on there. I like putting a little oil on the splines. Slides right on. And sometimes you have to wiggle it a little bit. This one went on really easy. If you have to fight it to get it on, 
then chances are one of the splines got nicked. So you want to take a look and see what's holding you up and make sure it slides fairly freely like this. The other thing you definitely want to try, once you have all your parts cleaned up, is we remember the smaller of the two sliders goes on the idler and the smaller section of the shift fork goes on there. So get this guy in the shift fork and you should have a little bit of play, but you should barely be able to wiggle it. There needs to be enough room in here for oil, but you should not be able to move this back and forth. A little tiny bit is fine, but if you see a wear groove in here or a groove worn into the fork pads on any of these, then you need to replace the fork. Very, very uncommon that we have problems with these forks. So we'll get this guy back on. There you go. And at this point, our idler assembly is pretty much ready to install. Okay, next we're gonna tackle our input gear assembly. It's all pretty simple. Just like our idler assembly, just did. not a lot of components to this. If you guys remember, two bearings, three snap rings. Important thing is that the snap ring groove on this bearing has to be at the end because it's retained in the case that way. You'll notice that our hardware and shafts are pretty darn clean and gears. We spend a lot of time prepping and polishing and getting things ready. One of the things we always do is polish seal surfaces like this one. The seal on this rides about here and then the transmission output seal rides about here. So if you see a groove worn there, you definitely don't want it. And then at that point, you wanna look for a replacement input shaft. In this case, it's in great shape, more than good enough to run. We wire wheel the splines to make sure there's no spline damage or rust or anything else. Then the gears, again, we try to wash all the Cosmoline off. Sometimes if you look really close, there's still a little tiny bit between the teeth. Cosmoline is designed to dissolve in engine oil, transmission oil, transmission fluid, so ATF, it dissolves. So if there's a little tiny bit left in there, once you put a couple miles on it, it dissolves in there, it doesn't do any harm. It's under pretty good. These gears were soaking in our hot solvent tank for probably four hours, and after multiple scrubbings, there's still a little bit in there. It's not anything to worry about. You wanna get the majority off, especially on the mating surfaces or where you have snap rings so everything sits flush. But if there's a tiny bit left on the gears, not a problem at all. To go back together, shaft, bearing's gonna go on, gear's gonna go on. If you remember, the recess section goes down so the splines don't bottom out. The snap ring is gonna retain it here. This snap ring is gonna retain the outer bearing or the rear bearing. And then a big snap ring is gonna go in the rear bearing to retain it in the case. Again, a little bit of gear oil. This we're gonna to put together in the press just like we took it apart in the press. I'm just prepping it here and then we'll walk it over to the press and push it together. This bearing can go either way, doesn't matter. It's one of those bisexual bearings. Yeah, exactly. Can use any of the target bathrooms. I've just found that if you put a thin film of oil on all these splines, they slide together so much better than if they're dry. If they're dry and there's just a tiniest little burr, they get stuck, little parts come off, they get galled together, and then it's just a bear to get them back apart. So having a tiny bit of oil on there definitely helps with the assembly process. Let's take this over to the press, press it together. In this case, we need to support the gear because we're trying to press the shaft into the bearing and the gear. So I'm gonna sit in the press like this. goes down nice and easy and smooth and you'll definitely feel a stop when both the bearing and the gear are bottomed out on the shaft. So at this point there should be no gap here and the gear pressed down to the bearing but the bearing still moves freely. Okay first of the three snap rings for the input assembly. There you go should snap into place pretty straightforward. Next thing Rear bearing needs to go on. Again, for the last time, this snap ring groove has to be on the rear portion. So I put a little bit of oil on here, just with my fingers. You can use a piece of tubing to knock that on. It's actually a little easier because ultimately, we have a snap ring groove here we need to worry about. So the bearing is going to get pressed on until it bottoms out on this ledge right here. So if we put in the press, we have to support it just right. On this one, we can just use a piece of inch and a half tubing. You just have to make sure that you're hitting it on the inner race, not on this seal. If for some reason the seal gets wiped out or it gets damaged, you can just pop it out and leave it out. You can use a pick and literally pull it out of there. When I start something like this, instead of starting with a piece of tubing that can walk around, I'll use a seal installer and just go part way down. Check it, make sure you're not bottomed out yet. 
you heard the difference. When I use a piece of tubing too, I don't just hold on to the piece of tubing, but I put mild pressure on it. So as I hit the bearing, there's already pressure, which helps get things going in the right direction. There you go. You heard the sound difference? That means at this point, we should be able to install our snap ring. There you go. Sliding it in sideways like that tells you, yes, we're down far enough, and that snap ring is going to go in the snap ring groove. This snap ring we cannot install yet until this assembly is in the case halves. But this one is ready to go. Our next step is to assemble the output cluster. This is the most complicated of gear clusters by far because it's got more than twice as many components as the other ones. So we'll start with our output hub, I guess is what you could call it. As discussed earlier, we have to put one of our side gears back in there because those splines in here is what drives the front output shaft. And we got the thrust washer off in a solvent tank. There shouldn't be a groove worn here or a groove worn here. Should be a very even surface. If that's worn at all, or that bushing is worn as discussed earlier, they need to be replaced. Put some gear oil on here, get that guy on there, a little more gear oil, and try to get gear oil into the oiling grooves here and on the bushing. If that bushing is dry and you start running the case until oil gets in there, it could possibly damage it a little bit. So getting some oil in there, not a terrible idea. Drop that in there, spin it a little bit. Should spin with just a tiny bit of resistance from the oil drag, and again, it shouldn't feel any play in there ever. So that one's good to go. Since we're installing a part-time kit in this one, we're now going to install a spool instead of the differential with the cross pin and the little idler gears and everything. This guy makes it a posi or a spool, and it's also splined on the inside because this is what ends up driving the rear output shaft. I like putting a little tiny bit of oil on this surface to help these guys slide in place. This is a very tightly machined tolerance in here between the outer diameter here and the inner diameter here. There's not a lot of chamfer here. There's a little tiny chamfer, but sometimes you gotta help these guys slide in place. And you might have to rotate it to line up all the bolt holes. That looks pretty good. And you can see it kind of wants to go on, but not really. And that's perfectly fine. For now, we're worried about lining up the bolt holes. Next part is we need to get our gear on there. So there's kind of a few things that need to happen all at once for this to be successful. And then we're gonna drop all the bolts through. They're gonna go through the spool, through our hub, and then thread into the gear. Again, this is a Sumo 315 low range gear, bigger in diameter, which is why we have to cut the cases and much lower gearing. Same thing here, bring it up through the bottom and line up the bolt holes. Here we go, you can see all the way through. Hold on to the ring gear. If that guy falls down, he might chip a tooth. And I drop a few of the screws in here and just gently start them. And this is just like anything else. You wanna start all these screws and then tighten them down evenly in a crisscross pattern so the ring gear moves up nice and even and everything gets sandwiched together perfectly parallel and stays aligned right. I like making sure I can thread these on by hand at least a couple of threads each, which tells me that everything's lined up right, instead of just barely getting them started and then you tighten one down and realize that one wants to cross thread or is not lined up right or what have you. It's actually one of the major issues I found with some of the other aftermarket gear sets, namely the Chinese stuff, is that the threads in the gear were not great and they galled some of the bolts on one of them it actually wouldn't work at all. I tried to help somebody with a transfer case that was building one. And at this point, you can very gently work your way back and forth, either with a ratchet or if you're confident in your abilities, you can do it with a little electric impact. If you do, just be gentle with it. Run each one in very slowly and work your way back and forth. You can see that as I'm doing this, as soon as the bolt starts to bog down the impact gun, I switch to another bolt and I keep crisscrossing it. You don't want to put a whole lot of stress on one bolt and pull that gear crooked. We're trying to raise it up level and evenly all the way around. At this point, most of them are tightened down all the way. We now have these guys fairly snug. They do need to be torqued properly, especially since the gear is a helical cut gear. So it's always either going to push that direction as it's being driven, or it's going to push that direction, depending on which way the vehicle is moving. So this gear is constantly not only trying to twist this way away from that hub, 
but it's trying to go this way and this way. When you have a component like this that utilizes a number of bolts that have to be torqued to a certain spec and Loctited, I usually get the component assembled and I work my way through a proper torque sequence or a crisscross pattern, what have you. I do it without Loctite because chances are you're gonna have to do three to five or six, seven rotations of the bolts before you get them set in place and as tight as you want. Every time you stop with a Loctite and then come back there and restart, that Loctite dries a little bit. So by the time you're on your final torque sequence, it could be dry enough that it just turns to powder. At that point, it's not doing anything for you. We do the same thing on oil pans and other components. We literally tighten them into place. Once we have everything tight, we take out one bolt at a time, we put Loctite on it, we torque it to final torque spec and we mark that bolt. That way we know the Loctite's good and it's torqued properly. So that's what we're gonna do in this case. This might seem a little tedious, but again, this might take an extra three minutes, but we'll ensure that you're never gonna have a problem with this gear coming loose on the hub or any of these bolts backing out and destroying your transfer case. So proper torque and proper bolt retention in this case is ultra crucial. You're using the red, the yep. heavy duty thread locker? Exactly. Blue stuff works, but it's so soft. Red, you can still remove by just unscrewing a bolt. Green is pretty much, we call it sleeve retainer. That's if you don't ever want something to come back apart. So smear it on it with my finger a little bit. And I take paint marker and I mark my bolt. That way I know that bolt doesn't just have Loctite on it. And I run them in slowly so the Loctite doesn't go flinging off, but then I also torque them with a torque wrench. So getting these tight enough can be a little bit of a challenge. You gotta hold on to it. We have a wooden fixture we use in a vise, but in this case, we're just gonna demonstrate how you can do it without any specialty tools again, and hopefully without busting Tim in the face with a torque wrench. There we go. Now, you gotta repeat the process 11 more times. Bolts are torqued and marked, gears in place. Everything looks good. Our spacing, or lack thereof, is even all the way around. Our bolts are protruding about the same distance all the way around. Now we need to install the rear bearing. Obviously the race on this is pretty narrow, so the chance of having the right size tubing is slim to none, unless you can machine one or make one or whatever you're gonna do. So to keep this as simple as possible, I'll show you a trick. Put a little bit of oil on here. One of the problems you run into with inner bearing races and cages is that, as you can see, the cage sticks up higher than the race. So if you take a larger version of this and put it on here and pound down on it, it's gonna distort this cage and the bearing's not gonna run true, it's gonna make noise and it's gonna fail. If you have just the right size diameter, like this one is almost perfect, you can use it. But what you also can do is you can take your old bearing, destroy the cage, get all the rollers out of there, and then lightly sand the inside of this. And you can use that as a bearing installer at that point. Turn around, so this guy makes it perfectly here, and then he can knock that bearing down. And just to give you out there in YouTube land, what he just said, he took off a little bit of material off of the inside of that to clearance it, so when he's using it as a driver, it doesn't get stuck. Right, it doesn't get stuck on here. Am I gonna get invited to YouTube land? Yeah, it's very nice. One of these days, they'll let me in. <laughs> Again, I'm keeping mild pressure on it and I have my hand wrapped around it to make sure that my installer tool stays centered and doesn't contact the cage. There you go, and you can hear it bottom out. Perfect spacing. This is in great shape. It's exactly where we need it to be. The other reason we want to do this is because now when we go to assemble the other side, we can use this as a pedestal to support this entire assembly so this cage, again, doesn't make contact. Like so. I, I like it. Here comes one of the fun parts. You guys remember when we took this apart, there was an itty bitty little dowel pin right in here. That needs to be there. It keeps this hub from spinning. That's what the hub looks like once it's cleaned up. There's the cutout, and here's a little dowel pin that we're gonna have in there. We also have this hub that needs to sit at the bottom. This raised portion goes down. This slider is going to go on it. Remember we talked about the windows being cut out. This should slide in here fairly readily and move readily. If it does not, then chances are one of these splines got nicked, either in the cleaning process or in the removal process. So you always wanna look at the teeth down here and make sure there's nothing that got folded over or damaged slightly. It does not matter which way this goes on. The splines on the inside are keyed all the same. So this can go any which way you want. The recess side goes up. Recess side goes up. The raised portion 
goes down and ends up resting on this land or lip right here. Okay, we're finally ready to install our hub. I found it to be easier to install the little pin now and you can use a little bit of grease or oil. In this case, I already have oil on here. It should hold it in place. Is that pin directional? Is that like a it's, flat slide and a dome side? It's or? not. They're cut the same on both sides and they're so small. I'm sure it's hard to tell in the video, but it's in there. To get it to line up, you can also look at this hub where the slot for the pin is cut it happens to be in line with an oiling hole. So you can look down this and draw an imaginary line. You see another oiling hole here. They're all in line. So if you look straight down that, you can line it up. This hole, this hole, and this hole will line up with the slot in the bottom here. So you can actually kind of see where it needs to go. So hub needs to go on, and this guy needs to go on. You can drive this on and it will force this down when it comes to it. So I start with one of these again to get it set in place. I look in here to make sure my pin is not moving out. This point, right size piece of tube. If you use another bearing race, it's only gonna move so far and you're gonna run out of material. So good size piece of tubing goes a long way on this. And when you smack this down, just work your way around the tube so it knocks it down nice and even. Again, a little bit of pressure, keep it concentric. Okay, stop halfway through, look at your pin. Yep, it's exactly where it needs to be. We're lined up at this point. We can finish driving it down. One last check. Yep. You can obviously do this in a press also, trying to show it in the simplest version possible. So get a little workout. You can hear the sound change. Typically means you're done. Now the fact that you got that hub to bottom out lets you know that that pin didn't become displaced right because if it got displaced and in in the way you wouldn't have been able to get it exactly all you, the way seated right? right you know it would have never allowed that pin to locate the sleeve and let it settle all the way down if you look you can see the hub is bottomed out where it should have been the sleeve is bottomed out against the hub and we're good to go again sit this guy on here so we're gonna damage the race okay now a couple more items we need to install one of them is our double bearing if you remember from taking it apart a split bearing Goes on like this. I like to test fit them. This is our Sumo underdrive output gear. Replaces the factory gear, slightly different tooth count to make up the difference. I test fit these just to make sure the bearings are gonna work right. Everything looks good. Put some oil on here. There we go. Now, if you remember it, one more bearing in here and then a flange, but we almost made a mistake. I forgot our slide collar or a slider. So slider goes on first. Again, has to travel nice and easy. A little bit of oil. And again, that's why I like to lay all my components out that I need for whatever assembly. So if I look at them, I can say, okay, all this has to be installed. If there's something left on the rag or however I have it laid out, I know I have a problem. Install your gear, should move easy. Now this guy should slide up and lock it in place. Let it go. Should spin easy again. And it travels nice and freely, which is what we want to see. Okay, at this point, we have our low speed output gear installed. A little bit of oil with a bearing creates a thrust surface. Then a roller bearing needs to go on. And then our drive hub is going to go on, which is what connects this to the front output shaft. Make sure our race is in place. heard the difference in sound test it you should be able to get this gear wiggling up and down a little tiny bit that accounts for an oil film that needs to be able to be present in here and heat expansion then we can install our hub a little bit of gear oil in the spline so they slide on without galling or chipping start with a seal driver bottom out which was pretty much this guy bottoming it out on the inner and outer and now switch over to the piece of tubing snap ring fits perfect in the groove there we go make sure the snap ring is seated evenly all the way around and our output cluster is complete
So through the powers of television, all of a sudden in 10 minutes, this transfer case has transformed itself from being filthy, nasty, and full of silicone to being beautiful. So front output housing, ready to go. We've got all the components laid out here. Front output shaft, slider and fork, the bearing that's gonna get pressed onto here, seal that's gonna write all the way down here, and then the hub that's gonna go in there for that slider to write on, and a couple of snap rings. First things first, bearing needs to go in. I installed the bearing first. If you put the seal in first, then you need to sit this down and get the bearing in there, and then you might knock the seal in too far. So I always do bearing first. You can see if you look closely in the bore here, there's a land for the bearing to sit on, and then there's a groove for the snap ring. So we're gonna oil that a little bit to help the bearing slide in place. This is a sealed bearing, so it will let a tiny bit of fluid through, but it always retains some oil in it. These usually just push in place with your fingers. Should be a pretty tight push, but you should be able to push it in there or gently tap it in. If you do tap it in, just make sure you're not tapping it on the inner bearing race, but you really need to tap it on the outer bearing race. So you work your way around the outside here, not inside. The snap ring goes in next. I like to roll these guys in. If you remember, when we took it apart, we we're able to use this little cutout or recess to pry the snap ring out of there. So I try to make sure that the opening in the snap ring is near that little cutout. Start with one side and work your way around. Usually you can just pop them right in. There you go, snap rings in. You'll notice that on the workbench, I have a selection of hub sockets and you're probably going, there are no nuts or anything that requires this size socket on this transfer case. I use those to install seals. If you look at these seals closely, they have a dust shield on them. So you can't just use a flat seal install and push on because you're gonna damage the seal. So I find a hub socket that's the right size to allow that seal to sit down in there with the dust shield not touching the socket, but the socket driving the seal in evenly. That way I know it's gonna go in straight and the socket will stop where it needs to and not drive the seal in too far. So you just drive it in flush with the housing? Yep. The other thing I like to do, even though most of the rebuild kits come with some silicone, I'm a stickler for using the right OEM Toyota silicone or FIPG. The part number for automatic and manual transmissions is a 1281. It used to be 1281, now it's 1281E. We talked about it earlier that the original silicone was orange in color. The E is the updated version, which is pink in color. So if we cut the end off, you'll see it in a minute. This stuff's not cheap. It's about 25 bucks a tube, but if it's gonna keep your transfer case from leaking, then I think it's a good investment. Realistically, you're not gonna use an entire tube on a transfer case, and you can use this on your differentials or anywhere else as well. So you apply some Ooh. to the seal? Absolutely. So I always put a little tiny bit of silicone on my finger, and I put, on any seal I install, I put a small bead of silicone around the outside, just a thin film, for two reasons. One of them is three reasons. It helps the seal slide in place, Eventually, when it dries, it glues the seal in place. It keeps it from moving. And if there are any imperfections in the surface, that silicone will fill in those imperfections and keep it from leaking. So you don't rely on the fact that that seal is rubberized to make a leak-proof seal with the housing. You always use that with this type of seal? Pretty much. On okay. every transfer case and transmission I build, differential, doesn't matter. You do if, it for engine too? For like the cam seals and crankshaft seals? Uh, rear main seal, absolutely. Yeah. Rear main seal? And front seal too, and the front retainer, absolutely. You know, okay. you never know who's worked on it before if they use a screwdriver to pull that seal out and then put a gouge in here. And obviously we can do a visual inspection, but just something I've gotten into the habit of doing. Some of the transfer cases we work on are 50 or 60 years old. So chances are we're not the first person who's touched it. This ensures that we don't have any leakage issues. You can rotate it and you can watch it. Just tap it around gently. Wipe off the excess here. And then you can just do a visual confirmation. You can even feel it with your finger to make sure that the seal is seated evenly all the way around. And in this case, it is. Okay, now that we have our bearing, snap ring, and seal installed, we can install our front output shaft. You'll see that I painted this. We clean them up really well and then paint them just to make sure, again, everything looks good. We don't want the rust. We polish the surfaces here, make sure there's no groove worn in the seal surface. A lot of times you'll see a dark ring, perfectly normal. If you can feel it with your finger or your fingernail, then you have a fairly deep groove. If there's any rust pitting, 
it'll always leak. So inspect these guys really well. Now, something to note that if you're not familiar with what George is talking about is that what created that line in the metal was the rubber seal causing that. And it's hard to understand, but over time, the rubber seal could actually wear away metal and actually cause a little divot in there. And if the new seal ends up riding in that same spot, then you might get a leak. And that's what George is talking about. You have to feel it. If there's an actual detectable groove where metal was worn away enough, then you might want to replace that part because you might get a leak. The other thing you'll notice is these splines are super shiny. We polish these on a wire wheel. Again, just to make sure that everything's in good shape. There's no rust, there's no dirt or contamination packed in here. Splines are all nice and clean. So when I assemble everything, everything goes together nicely. Okay, now it's time to install our front output shaft into the front extension housing. Just like on the last couple of components, this shiny surface is where the bearing is going to ride. You can see the little holes for the oil passages and the oil pump. This is where the oil exits from the center of the shaft. It gets forced in here, then works its way out in different locations to make sure it creates proper oil flow. So I always put some oil on the surfaces where things are pressed together. And I even put a little bit on the seal surface here. So when this shaft gets pressed into the seal, it doesn't fold the seal backwards. Make sure that the seal slides in place and stays there. And it keeps it from rusting. It's also for the first startup too, that's not gonna cause uh, damage to the seal when it's gonna be dry, right? Exactly, exactly. So yeah, any moving parts for first startup, you gotta have lubrication on it. The problem you run into if you don't have a fixture like we do is how do you support the shaft while you're installing it here? If you go this way, obviously it's gonna bottom out on the bench. You might be able to do it like that and knock it in. The other thing you can do, find a piece of steel tube. This is actually a spacer out of an SM465. So in order to not damage these studs or press them out of the shaft during installation, we're gonna support the shaft by that. We have oil on the splines, on the bearing surface, and a little bit on the seal surface. You can now slide this guy down on there. And then again, find a decent sized piece of tube. This is out of a Land Cruiser transmission. Just to make a note that you want this piece of tube to be contacting the inner race. You don't want it to overlap to where the ball bearings are and cause damage. So this has to be in good contact with the diameter of the inner race for it to work properly. Right, but you don't want it too tight on the shaft on the splines because obviously it needs to clear these splines. This piece of tube just happens to work perfect. Put another one over it and then tap it on. I usually spin these part way through to get the seal a chance to settle into place. Feels good. And that's it. You can feel a slight bit of resistance from the seal, but it turns smoothly and evenly. Now we can install our hub. It needs to settle down in there. A little bit of oil on the splines. You heard the sound change, it means it's bottomed out. Make sure you can spin the housing freely, that there's even drag or resistance. And then if you look closely, if you follow these splines down, you can reach in here with a pick or a screwdriver and see that our snap ring groove is now exposed, which means this hub and the bearing are seated all the way where they should be. Okay, if you look at the rest of the parts for a front output housing, we now know that we only have a snap ring left, a fork and rail, and the collar, the slider for the front. Snap ring goes on first. Just let it drop down on there, find the opening. On these, especially if I can't see them from the side, I like to come in with a pick and make sure that I cannot get my pick under it. So I know the snap ring is seated all the way and you can look all the way around and make sure that it's evenly spaced, that one side doesn't stick out further than the other. If you're not 100% sure, you can always take a piece of tubing and just tap it once lightly just to make sure that'll seat it the rest of the way. Okay, the last two items we need to install in the front output housing is this slider. As we talked about before, the chamfered side of the teeth or splines needs to face up because the slider pretty much rests on this hub and then is brought back to match up with this part of the output cluster to lock it in four wheel drive. So it needs to be able to ratchet into place 
That's why your chamfer teeth are up. Again, any moving part on lubricate. So there's a hole in here where the shift rail goes. You can see it right here. This is the end of the rail. Then the rail, this fork can actually rotate on here. So I'd like to put a little bit of oil on the clips on the end that can soak in there. We know it goes in like so, which means the slider needs to go in like this with the chamfered side, not the square side. Put that guy on here, a little more oil in here. Since this is going to rotate as soon as the transfer case turns, and then a little bit of oil on the spines. And you don't have to worry about which way this is facing yet. We'll worry about that later. It's easy enough to rotate. Sometimes these are a little bit of a bear to line up since the spines are square, but there you go, slid right in. And just for good measure, one more swipe of oil so it can soak into those spines and move freely when we're done. That's it for the front output. All right, so rear extension housing, also ready to go, prepped. We have all our parts, or most of our parts, right here. Same as the front. We start with the bearing, then we're going to install the seal, then we're going to install the shaft, and then stack everything else in there. A little bit of oil for the bearing. Same thing. You have a land for the bearing to ride on or stop on, and then there's a snap ring groove. So the bearing needs to slide in there, and then the snap ring is going to retain it. You should be able to push that one in by hand too. Yeah, sometimes they're a little snug. You just have to make sure that it starts out straight and you can kind of feel it if it doesn't want to go down in and sometimes you have to tap them a little. This one's going. It's one of those things you do by feel. I have to tap it down a little tiny bit. And again, I'm trying to show you guys how to do this without specialty tools. Okay. If you have the perfect size seal installer for that bearing, then you could drive it in with that. But we want to make very sure that we're not driving on the inner race, that we're driving on the outer race. So if you have a long drift, you can just very gently work your way down around the outer race. And you heard the sound change and I could feel the bearing move. Now it's seated all the way down. To confirm that, you can always take a pick, come down in here next to the outer race and you'll feel the snap ring groove. Can't feel the groove here anywhere, then obviously the bearing's not in far enough. Okay, the rear case half obviously is much deeper, especially for the HF2A case, the HF2A V for viscous coupler, because it's as much longer as it needs to be for that viscous coupler to be housed in there. The earlier cases without the viscous coupler literally are missing this much, so they're much shorter and a little easier to deal with. You don't have to reach down in as far. On the viscous coupler style case, you just have to reach down in and do everything. So it's a little more challenging, but not really. It's another reason why I like to build the front output housing first, Kind of get used to the idea, then you deal with a rear that's a little more challenging. So drop your snap ring in, start one side. There you go, that side's in, and then just work your way around. And it'll snap in. And again, you want to take a look and make sure that you see the same amount of material all the way around that there is not more on one side than the other, just to make sure the snap ring seated all the way in the groove. We're doing the same trick on the rear seal as we did on the front output seal by using a big hub socket to install the seal, hold it in place. Again, thin film of silicone, it doesn't take much at all. And this is just added insurance. It's not 100% essential. I just like doing it for peace of mind. We'll film all the way around and then we can install the seal. Kind of look at it all the way around. Wipe off the excess and then check your height. Make sure it's even all the way around. Feels good, that part's done. Now we can move on to installing the rear output shaft, very similar to the front output shaft, except for this one obviously has the sealing rings we talked about earlier with the oil passage and the little oil exits or ports. So sealing rings and then a number of snap rings. Again, we polish the shaft, polish the splines, checked everything, check the seal surface, check the bearing surface oil on the ceiling rings for sure and it's much easier to put the oil on there now versus when the shaft's installed since it's so far down in there then on the splines these are the splines that retain the, the speedo gear or drive the speedo gear lock into it this is our bearing surface and this is our seal surface again you can see a, a really thin black line it looks like a black line on the seal surface that's what a rubber seal has polished the steel over the last 20 years as long as you can't feel a groove there, you're perfectly fine. Just a slight discoloration, not a problem at all. And you also call that a witness mark for where the seal rides. Absolutely. 
And that really tells you exactly where the seal rides in relation to that seal surface. We don't want to drop this guy down in there because then it's going to hit our oil passenger or our oiling tube, damage the oiling tube. That can cause issues in a transfer case. So again, you have to be gentle. Same spacer. You can obviously do this in a press also. The nice thing is that in a small press, you can just sit this on your bed, on the press bed, the shaft will go in between and you can press down on this, or you can use a piece of tubing. In this case, we're gonna take it over to the press and press it in there really quick. Okay, we have our rear extension housing in the press, use a couple spacers. Again, this doesn't take a whole lot. It's not like we're pressing 10 tons. This might be a few hundred pounds. And you can see that I can press it in without even using a lever. I'm just using my hand to press this guy in. There you go, came to a stop, take pressure off. First thing I do, I check this to make sure, just like the front, it turns evenly and with a little bit of resistance. Feels great, so we're done with the press. So rear housing, shaft is pressed in, everything looks good. Next thing we're gonna do, just like any other time, is we have to make sure a snap ring groove is where we need it to be. So I can take my pick, get it in here, and it's catching on the groove. So in theory, snap ring should go right in and retain that shaft in the bearing. Again, we had a total of four snap rings in this rear extension housing. One of them was a large snap ring to retain the bearing in the case. The next one is gonna retain the shaft to the bearing. Then we're gonna stack in the speedo gear with another snap ring. And if we kept the viscous coupler, then we would use this little snap ring all the way towards the top to keep the viscous coupler in place. Since we're doing a part-time kit, this will be omitted. We're not going to use it at all. So first snap ring needs to go in or second, really. Open it up, slide your fingers down on one side. Okay, we have the snap ring for the bearing seated. This is the Speedo drive gear that we talked about during this assembly. If you look at it closely, you'll see that there are splines on the ID on one end. Most of it is smooth. The spline portion goes towards the top and then a snap ring retains it. That way this gear cannot move independently of the shaft and gives you accurate speed reading. It just slides down in there. Those splines, they're not necessarily loose, but they slide together very readily. And we put a little bit of oil on there to make the installation easier. Our third snap ring is going in. There you go, it's in place. Okay, the next step is the oiling system components for the rear extension housing. So we're gonna deal with the oil plate, which is gonna sit down into the extension housing and the ceiling rings are going to ride in here. It's very easy to line this up because we know this is the oil passage, which has to line up with the oil passage coming down. So if you look at it closely, oil comes in here, goes through this little passage and comes in here between the ceiling rings and then enters a the shaft through a hole in the shaft and gets distributed throughout. To get this in there, the ceiling rings are very hard and they're expanded right now. So you are almost using this like a ring compressor on an engine on the pistons. The rings physically need to smoosh together to go in here and then they're spring loaded to keep tension on the outside to create the seal. So to do that, you definitely want a lot of oil on the ceiling rings. We put some on the shaft earlier before we even installed it. I also like to put a layer of oil down on the surface where the oil plate resides in the case. I put some oil in the bore where the ceiling rings ride and to help them slip in place. And I even put some around the outside to help that slide in place. And gently, and I usually just put a finger in here to keep hold of it, lower that down on there. You can always rotate it in place. And then very gently try to walk it down a little bit. Sometimes they slide down on their own. Sometimes you have to help them a little bit with the bolts. I prefer to just walk them down by hand and I press on one side a little bit and kind of go back and forth and keep turning it to make sure your rings aren't binding up. Keep pressing, turn a little bit. Okay, and then you can feel it all the way around and see how far down it's dropped. This side's a little high, so we're gonna press on this side a little bit, turn some more. That feels pretty even all the way around. Now we need to look down in there to make sure our bolt holes are lined up, which it looks like they are. At this point, we can put our splash guard in there. This splash guard is just a tin shield. The center of it was at the drain plug. Again, there are two holes here. It could line up one of three ways, but we know it's supposed to be on the bottom of the case, so it's going to drop down in this way. The bolts are pretty small, so to get these started, it's definitely easiest to use a magnet. Feed it down in there, see if you can get it started. That one's good. 
that one's good. And that one's good. Once I have all three of the bolts started, I take out one at a time. I put a little dab of Loctite on there and then I tighten them down. It's actually even a better idea to snug these guys down now until they're bottomed out to make sure the oil plate is in the right position. Always make sure to still turn smoothly. If it doesn't, then chances are the ceiling rings got a little bound up. Tighten these guys down a little bit, check, make sure everything works. Then we'll take them back out one at a time, put some Loctite on them, install them for the final time. Again, I tighten these bolts down just with my fingers like this, really gently and evenly all the way around. I'm just twisting the extension with my fingers. I'm not putting any pressure on the ratchet, really. And then turn it again, make sure everything feels free. Wake your way back and forth, or around in this case. You don't even need a ratchet, really. Okay, that feels like they're seated all the way. Now we're gonna check it with the ratchet to make sure. Yep. Okay, that feels good. Turns nice and smooth and evenly. You can just feel a little bit of drag from the seal so we know everything's right. At this point, we'll take out one at a time and add some Loctite to keep them in place. And you're using red Loctite on this one too? Yes. I hardly ever use blue Loctite, but I don't use a big amount either. I just use a little bit. There's no pressure on these bolts. That oil plate has no pressure behind it. It doesn't have any thrust issues. And same with this tin shield, it doesn't weigh enough. So this is just added insurance to make sure that these bolts cannot back out. And you get the idea. He's gonna do the same with the other two bolts. He's gonna take them out, put a little Loctite in, put it back in and cinch it up snug with his ratchet. The three bolts that hold the oil plate in, as well as this splash guard, just like the bolts that hold the oil pump cover on, they're just six millimeter bolts. They're not very big. So I never use electric tools on installation. And realistically, between 30 and 50 inch pounds of torque is really all you need. If you go a whole lot tighter, you're gonna snap one off and then you have a lot of work ahead of you. Again, there's not a lot of pressure behind these guys. So don't kill them. A little tiny drop of Loctite, 30 to 50 inch pounds and you're good to go. You know, if you're using a, a small quarter drive ratchet, if you've done enough work to handle a T-case, you should pretty much know how tight you want to make these bolts. You use that German spec, good and tight. Austrian spec. Oh, it's Austrian. I've been wrong all these years. Man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so last check. Turns nice and smooth, but with a little bit of drag from the oil rings and the seal, but nice and even. So we're good there. We're not using the last snap ring again because we're not reusing the viscous coupler. So this can go somewhere into the abyss. Last part we need to do for the rear extension housing before we put the cases together is to install the oil pump assembly. A little geo rotor setup. Since it's an oil pump, we definitely want quite a bit of oil in here so we don't have any issues with it wearing. If you remember right, this guy- Had the arrow. Had the arrow on top, exactly. And the little raised portion here, which sits down into that recess. So you can literally drop it in there and sits in there and spins. If you went the other way, it could float anywhere. So once that guy's in there, again, get some oil in there. You know, it's an oil pump. It's nice to have that thing primed. Drop it down in there. It'll find its home. There you go. Go to your home. Arrow here, arrow here. I can see the arrows. And yeah. then to test it, this is our little drive that actually is driven by the idler assembly. That's why the idler has these slots cut out. This guy sits in here. The other side slides in here, turns nice and smooth. So at this point, we know that's good. Now we need to install our little oil pump plate. This one, there is a way to figure it out and explain it where the passages end up and everything. The easiest thing to do is just drop it down on there and rotate it until your holes line up, which would be right here. Again, I put some oil on top of the gears and the little geo rotor. Now we know these guys are gonna line up. Take our Torx bit, start these guys. And I run these all the way down by hand. And again, these pumps don't make a lot of pressure so you don't have to worry about perfect torque setting or sealing it or anything else. It creates oil flow. It's not like an engine oil pump where you're creating 20 to 80 PSI. This thing might push half a PSI. It's just circulating oil. So to make sure we have it right, take your little drive key, right? Hex portion goes in here, should drop down in there, and then it should turn 
just like this output, it should turn smoothly with a little bit of oil drag. We know that's right. If the bolts weren't lined up right, then this hex wouldn't settle down in there. At this point, we can set this guy aside with the rest of our parts for the rear extension housing that we're gonna install once the cases are built. We're gonna take these bolts back out one at a time, add a little drop of Loctite, go Austrian tight on it, Austrian and we'll be tight. done with this. Okay, and you don't need to see it. He's just got to take them out one at a time, a little drop of red Loctite, reinstall it to that German spec of Guten Tight. Oh, sorry, Austrian spec. I'm not sure if we're going to invite this guy back. <laughs> All right, the reassembly of the transfer case, it's getting a little bit long because George is doing such an excellent job of describing everything he's doing, and we're showing a lot of detail. So we're going to cut the video here and finish the video in part four. We'll see you in part four where we finish the reassembly of this FJ80 Land Cruiser transfer case.